Chapter 7 of The Black Eagle Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Overby, Parkland, Washington. Dedicated to Uni. Chapter 7 of The Black Eagle Mystery by Geraldine Bonner. Molly tells the story. Murder. Will I ever forget that night when Babbitts told me, the two of us shut in our room? I can see his face now, thrust out towards me, all strained and staring, his voice almost a whisper. As for me, I guess I looked like the village idiot, with my mouth dropped open and my eyes bulged so you could cut him off with a shingle. The next day, the same word went out to us that had been given to Mrs. Meager. Silence. Not a whisper, not a breath. Neither the public, nor the press, nor the police must get an inkling. All there was to go upon was the story of a child, and until this could be confirmed by other facts, the outside world was to know nothing. If corroborative evidence were found, it would be the biggest sensation the Whitney office had ever had. Babbis was promised a scoop, but if he gave away a thing before the time was ripe, it would be the end of us, as far as Whitney and Whitney went. Six shared the secret. The Whitneys, father and son, the Babbitses, husband and wife, Jack Reddy, and O'Malley. In twenty-four hours Mrs. Meager and Danny were spirited off to a farm upstate, and the old man had a seance with Meager, the drayman, and shut his mouth tighter than a gag. The six of us were organized into a sort of band to work on the case. It seemed to me we were like moles, tunneling along underground, not a soul on the surface knowing we were there, and if they'd found it out, not able to make a guess what we were after. O'Malley and I were the only two that were put right on the scene of the crime. I was to stay on the Black Eagle switchboard to pick up all I could from Troop the boy who operated the one elevator, which was running that night, to find out about the people he had taken up or down from the 17th floor between 5 and 6.30. O'Malley was commissioned to examine the Azalea Woods Estates offices and get next to Mrs. Hanson, cleaner of the top floors, and see if she had seen anything on the evening of January 15th. What we ferreted out I'll put down as clearly and quickly as I can. It may not be interesting, but to understand a case that was interesting, it's necessary to know it. O'Malley got busy right off, quicker than I, but he knew better how to do it. The Azalea Woods estate was vacated, and that was easy. His search only gave up one thing, two dark spots on the floor of the private office close to the window. With a chisel, he shaved off the wood on which they were, and was sent to a chemist, who analyzed the spots as blood. What he heard from Mrs. Hanson was even more important, and he did it well, warming it out of her in easy talk about the suicide. I'll boil it down to simple facts, not as I heard him tell it in Mr. Whitney's den, with bits about Mrs. Hanson that you couldn't help but laugh at. On the night of January the 15th, she was at work on the 17th floor at half-past five. Behind the elevators, round on the side corridor where the service stairs go down, is a sink closet where the cleaners kept their brooms and dusters. Having finished with the rear office, she went into this closet to empty and refill her pails at a little before six. While in there, she could hear nothing because of the running water, but when she turned it off, she heard steps coming down the stairs on the Broadway side. She had moved out into the hall when the steps stopped and rounding the corner by the elevators she saw Mr. Harlan standing at the door of the Azalea Woods Estates offices. He was in profile, and didn't see her, and didn't hear her, she said, because she wore old soft shoes that made no sound. Just as she caught sight of him, she remembered she'd left her duster in the sink closet and went back for it. When she returned to the main corridor he was gone, and she went into the Hudson Electrical Company's offices, staying there till 6.20. She noted the time by a nickel clock on one of the desks. She decided to do the Azalea Woods Estates rooms next, but on trying the door found it locked. This didn't bother her, as she had found it so once or twice before during the past month. She then went down the hall into a rear suite in which she was shut when the suicide occurred. This fixed the fact that Harlan had gone straight from his own office down the stairs on the Broadway side into the Azalea Woods Estates, and that he, or somebody in there, had locked the door. Who had let him in? What man had access to these offices? Can you see me as I sat listening to O'Malley and thinking of the fresh guy who'd wanted to take me out at dinner? Lord, I felt queer. And I felt queerer, considerable queerer, when the day after that I got hold of Troop. And information. Wait till I tell you. Mr. Whitney had told me to take my time, there was no rush, and above all things not to raise a ghost of suspicion in Troop's mind. So I went about it very foxy, lying low in my little den behind the elevators. But when I'd see Troop lounging in the door of his car, I'd flash a smile at him and get a good-natured grin back. The evening after O'Malley brought in his stuff, I thought the time was ready to gather in mine. So after I'd put on my hat and coat, 
I stood loitering by the desk, keeping one eye on the door. The troop came off duty at half-past six, and regular, a few minutes after that, I'd see him sprinting down the hall for the main entrance. As he came in sight, I took up my purse, and he, looking in, as I knew he would, caught me just right. But there I was staring, distracted into it, and scrabbling round in the inside, pulling out handkerchiefs and samples and buttons and latch keys. Hello, says he, drawing up. You look like you'd lost something. Oh, Mr. Troop, I answered. How fortunate you happened along. I have lost something, my car fare, and I ain't got another cent but a ten-dollar bill. Will you come across with a nickel till tomorrow? Sure I will. And more, too. Uh, which way do you go? Uptown, said I. Neither he nor anyone else in the building knew where I lived or who I was. Miss Morgenthau, temporarily in charge, was all they had on me. That's my direction, uh, 159th Street, Subway. Now I didn't see myself sleuthing as I hung from the strap in the sub. But in this world you gotta grab your chance when it comes, so... The subway for mine, I said, speaking in a cheerful, unmarried voice, and out we trotted into the street. It was the thick of the rush hours, and we were in the thick of the rush. Like we were leaves on a raging torrent, we were whirled through the gate, swept onto the platform and carried into the car. Then the conductor came and pressed on us leaned and squeezed, and when he'd mashed us in, slid the door shut for fear we'd burst out and flood the platform. Troop got hold of a strap, and I got hold of Troop, and, dangling together like a pair of chickens hung up to grow tender, I opened on the familiar subject of the Harlan suicide. It wasn't as hard as I thought, for what with people clawing their way out and prying their way in, questions and answers were bound to be straight, with no trimmings. "'Where were you when it happened?' I said, getting a jiu-jitsu grip on the front of his coat. In the car, halfway down. Didn't know a thing till I got round to the ground floor and saw the stampede. What did you do? Ran for the street. Forgot my job. Forgot there was only one car running. Forgot everything and made a break. Every passenger did the same. Seized us all same as a panic, all racing and hollering. I was right behind Mr. Ford. It was sooner than I expected. The jump I gave was lost in that crush, just as the look that started out on my face wouldn't be noticed. Or, if it was, be set down to a stamp on my toe. Was he in the car with you? Yes. I'd just gone up to the seventeenth floor for him. Here, you may want to get a firm hold on me or you'll be swept away. I'm holding, I gasped. And believe me, I was. For a line of people coming out like a bit of the Johnstown flood was like to tear me loose from my moorings. Then he must have been in the elevator when Mr. Harlan jumped? That's it. It was his ring brought me up to the seventeenth floor. He got in and it was while we was going down. The body fell. Struck the street a few minutes before he reached the bottom. We were whizzing through the blackness of the tunnel to Times Square. The overflow that had drained off at 42nd Street had loosened things up a little. I unwrapped myself from around Troop, taking hold of the strap over his hand and pigeonholing what he said. In that boiling pack of people, I was cold and shivery down the spine. Did Mr. Ford run out in the street like the rest? Did he? He'd done a marathon. I couldn't make a dent in the crowd, but he shoved through, and when he come back, he was all broke up. What do you make of that, says he. There's a man committed suicide, and they say it's Rawlings Harland. Broke up, I shouldn't wonder. He was in the office late, wasn't he? Till half by six? He was that night, and he had been once or twice before this last month. Told me he was working overtime, though if you ask me, I'd have said he wasn't the kind to do more than his salary called for. No, I said, thinking hard underneath. Seems sort of loaferish. Well... I wouldn't say that, but easy, good-humored, you know the sort. But lately he's been on the job, busy, I guess, getting ready for the collapse. The night of the suicide he left early, soon after Miss Barry, and a little after six, ten or fifteen minutes maybe, he come bustling back, saying he'd forgotten some papers, and for me to shoot him up quick. We slowed up for 69th Street, and two girls in the middle of the car began a football rush for the door. It was a good excuse to be quiet, to get it straight in my head. Ford left early, came back went into the office after Harland, left probably three or four minutes before the body was flung from the window. This was the way I was thinking while we hung easy from our strap, swinging out sideways like the woman in Curfew Shall Not Ring Tonight, clinging to the tongue of the bell. Now that was real conscientious of him, I said, suspended over a large fat man and crushing down the paper he was trying to read, coming back for the papers he'd forgotten. It sure was, said Troop. Many a man would have let them wait. The fat man dropped the paper and raised his eyes to me, with a look like he was determined to be patient. But why did I do it? Pardon me, sir, says I, but it's not me that's spoiling your homeward journey. It's the congested condition of the Empire City. And then to Troop, 
pleasant and regretful. Dear, dear, that's a lesson not to pass judgment on your fellow creatures. He must have a strong sense of duty. I suppose you waited for him. Uh, not me, said Troop. That's the time I'm on the jump with all the offices emptying, and especially that night with the other elevator out of commission. Besides, it wouldn't have been no use, for he was in there quite a while. It wasn't till nearly half-past six he rang for the car. Pity he didn't wait a few minutes longer. Maybe if Harland had seen him, he'd have given up the idea of suicide. I've thought of that myself, for according to the inquest, Harlan was round that corner for a half hour, like as not pacing up and down while Ford was sitting in the office nearby. Strange, ain't it, the way things that happen in this world? It was. A great deal stranger than he thought. For a moment I didn't say anything. I was kind of quivering, in my insides with the excitement of it. O'Malley hadn't got anything to beat this. We swung lazily back and forth, my hand clasped below troops, and the fat man giving up in despair. Only when my wrist bag caught him on the hat, he gave me one reproachful look, and then settled the hat hard on his head to show me what he was suffering. The train began to slow up. White tiled walls gilded past the windows, and the conductor opened up the door and yelled, Ninety-six Street! It had worked out just right. I had my information, and here was where I got off. I thanked Troop for the ride I'd had off him, told him I'd give him his nickel tomorrow, and forging to the door like the Oregon going round Cape Horn, I scrambled out. Himself wasn't at home to tell things to. It was one of his late nights. So I took a call from Mr. Whitney's office and told him I got the stuff for him. Real stuff. He said to come down that evening at half-past eight. They'd all be there. And after a glass of milk and a soda cracker, I hadn't had time or appetite for more. Out I lit, as excited as if I was going to a six-reel movie. I was late, and ran panting up the steps of the big, grand house in the West Fifties. I'd been there before, and as I stood waiting in the vestibule, I couldn't but smile, thinking of that other time when I was so scared, and himself, he was Mr. Babbitt's then, had had to jolly me up. He didn't know me as well then, as he does now, bless his dear, faithful heart. The unnatural solemn butler wasn't on the job tonight. Mr. George opened the door for me, and showed me into that same room off the hall, with the gold-mounted furniture and the pale-colored rugs, and the lights in crystal bunches along the walls. A fire was burning in the grate, its red reflection leaping along the uncovered spaces of floor, polished and smooth as ice. On the center table, all gilt and glass, was a common student lamp, looking cheap and mean in that quiet, rich, glittering room, and besides it were some sheets of paper and several pencils. Old Mr. Whitney and George were there, also Jack Reddy, but O'Malley hadn't come yet. I told them what Troop had said, and they listened as silent as the grave, not batting an eye while I spoke. You didn't have to guess what they thought. It was in the air. The first real move had been made. When I finished, Mr. George, who had been making notes on one of his bits of paper, threw down his pencil, and gave a long, swift whistle. The old man, sitting by the fire looking into it, his hands clasped loosely together, the fingers moving round each other, which was the way he had when he was sinking, said very quiet, Thank you, Molly. You've done well. This puts Ford in the center of the stage, said Mr. George, and then turning to his father, Pretty conclusive, eh, governor? The old man grunted without looking up, his face in the firelight, heavy and brooding. Jack rose, and leaning over George's shoulder, looked at the scribbled notes. Left soon after the very girl, came back around 6.15, and went to the Azalea Woods Estates offices. That would have been about 15 to 20 minutes after Harland. Came out about half past six, and was in the elevator when the body fell. Positive proof that he was in the rooms with Harland, said Mr. George, and equally positive proof that he was not the man seen by the meager child. Evidently... Two men, said Jack. Two men, echoed Mr. George. Then he turned to me. Where was Miss Whitehall? Did this troop fellow say anything about when she left? Jack looked up from the notes and cast a quick, sharp glance at me. She'd gone already, of course. Yes, she'd gone, I answered. Anyway, old Barry said she always went before six. Then, in answer to Mr. George, I didn't ask troop anything about her. I didn't think there was any need, and I was afraid I'd get him curious if I wanted to know too much. Good girl, came from the old man, in a rumbling growl. At that moment there was a ring at the bell. With an exclamation of, O'Malley, Mr. George jumped up and went into the hall. It was O'Malley, red as a lobster, and with an important roll to his walk. He stood in the door and looked at the old man in a triumphant way, till you'd suppose he'd got the murderer outside, chained to the door handle. Babbitt's who'd come to know him well on the trip to Rochester, said he was a first-rate chap and was as sharp as a needle, if you could get over his taking himself so dead serious. When he heard my story, 
some of the starch was taken out of him, but I will say he was so interested that, after the first shock, he forgot to be jealous and was as keen as mustard. Two men, sure enough, he agreed, and two men who operated together, one of them in that back room. How do you make that out? asked Jack. I'll show you. I've been busy this afternoon. He looked round, selected a gold-legged chair, and, pulling it to the table, sat down, and, taking a fountain pen from his pocket, drew a sheet of paper towards him. Right next to the church, as you may remember, there are three houses, dwellings. The one nearest the church is occupied by a private party. The two behind have been thrown together and are run as a boarding house. The last two has a rear extension built out at the end of the lot. The day we examined the Azalea Woods estates, I saw that the windows of that extension commanded the side wall of the Black Eagle building. This afternoon, I went to the boarding house, said I was a writer looking for a quiet place to work, and asked if they had an empty room in the extension. They had one, not yet vacated, but to be in February. It was occupied by an old lady, Miss Darnley, who being there gave me permission to see it. Now here's where I get busy. He drew the paper towards him and began marking it with long straight lines and little squares. Miss Darnley is a nice old lady and some talker. We got gassin, as natural as could be, on the horrible suicide of Mr. Harlan, so close by. She took me to the window and showed me where his offices were, and told me how it was her habit, every evening as night fell, to sit in that window and watch the lights start out, especially in the Black Eagle building. I sat there always till half-past six, when the first gong sounded for dinner, and if I took the room I was to be sure and go down then. The food was better. She always did. By a little skillful jollying, mostly surprised at her powers of observation and memory, I got from her some significant facts about the lights of the seventeenth floor of the Black Eagle building on the night of January 15th. The Harland suite, she located it from her papers, was lit till she went down to dinner. Wonderful how she remembered. How was the floor below? Bet a hat she couldn't remember that. But she could, and proud as a peacock, she gave a demonstration. All dark as it usually was at six, then a light in the fourth window. Azalea was a state's private office. Then that goes out, and the three front windows are bright. Just before she goes down to dinner, she notices that every window on the whole sweep of the seventeenth floor is dark, except that fourth one. Azalea was a state's private office. He stopped, and pushed the paper he'd been drawing on across to George. Here it is, with the time as I make it marked on each window. Jack and Mr. George leaned down, studying the diagram, and Mr. Whitney slowly rose, and coming up behind them, looked at it over their shoulders. All their faces, clear in the lamplight, with O'Malley's, red and proud, glancing sideways at the drawing, were intent and frowning. "'Let's see how this thing works out,' said Mr. George, taking up a pencil and pulling a sheet of paper towards him. Mr. Whitney straightened up with a sort of tired snort, and slouched back to his seat by the fire. Mr. George began, figuring on the paper. "'The Azalea Wood States were cleared at six. All lights out. At a few minutes after, Harlan came down the stairs and entered them going through to the private office and switching on the light, or meeting someone there who switched it on as he came. Some ten or fifteen minutes later, Ford came in. That's evidently the moment, according to your old lady, when the private office was dark and the other two lit up. Just before 6.30, time when Ford left, the front rooms were all dark again. Good deal of a mess to me. He tilted back in his chair so he could see his father. What do you make of it, Governor? Well, let's hear what O'Malley has to say first said Mr. Whitney. They couldn't see his face, which was turned to the fire, but I could, and it had a slight amused smile on it. O'Malley sprawled back in his chair, with his chest thrown out. Well, I don't like to commit myself so early in the game, but there are a few things that seem pretty clear. Though the Azalea Woods estates were dark when Mr. Harlan came down, somebody was there. Who? asked Jack. O'Malley looked sort of pitying at him. His murderer? This man didn't attempt the job alone. Must have held Harlan in talk in the private office till later when Tony Ford came in and helped, if he didn't do the actual killing. When that was over, Ford went, leaving the other man to carry out the sensational denouement. What could have been Ford's motive? said Mr. George. Did he know Harlan? O'Malley grinned. Oh, we'll find a motive, all right. Wait till we've turned up the earth in his tracks. Wait a few days. This other man, O'Malley, said Mr. Whitney. Have you any ideas about him? There you got me stumped, said the detective. Of course we don't know Harlan's inner life. Had he an enemy, and if so, who? But he paused, and let his glance move over to the faces of the two young men. If the thing hadn't been physically impossible, I would have turned my searchlight eye on Johnston Barker. Barker, explained George, but Barker was— 
O'Malley interrupted him with a wave of his hand. I said it was physically impossible. The old man got up, shaking himself like a big, drowsy animal, and came forward into the lamplight. Nevertheless, gentlemen, he said quietly, I'm convinced that it was Johnston Barker. They all gasped at him. I think for the first moment they thought he had some information they hadn't heard, and waited open-mouthed for him to give it to them. But he stood there, smiling a little, his eyes moving from one to the other, sort of quizzical as their surprise tickled him. Now, father, said Mr. George, what's the sense of saying that when we know that Barker was on the floor above, unable to get out without being seen? I know, George, I know, said his father mildly. I'm perfectly willing to admit it. But in that room, on the floor above, there had been a quarrel between the two men. Since the disappearance of Barker, there's been a good deal of speculation as to the nature of that quarrel. That is, the public has speculated. I have felt sure. After the disappearance of that quarrel, as far as I could see, had only one interpretation. The lawyer had discovered the perfidy of his associate and threatened exposure. And we all know that the only silent man is a dead man. That's all very well, said O'Malley. But it doesn't get round the fact that Barker couldn't possibly have been there to instigate the murder, or help in murder, or commit a murder himself. Quite true, said the old man, as far as we know at present. But you will see we know very little. We can speak with more authority when we've made a second examination of the Whitehall offices and a first one of the Harlan suite. That's up to you, O'Malley, as soon as you can manage it. There's another important matter, but I can't see my way clear to getting it just yet. Ford's own explanation of his movements that evening. I'm curious to hear what he has to say, but that'll have to wait till... He paused, and Mr. George cut in. We land him in jail, which I hope will be soon. Presently, presently, said his father, turning to the fire. And now, gentlemen, I think we'll end this little seance. Just look out, George, and see if the limousine's there for Molly. It was. And they all drifted out, talking as they went, making the date and arranging the plan for the examination of the two offices. I'd said goodbye to the old man and was following them into the hall, when he caught me by the arm and, drawing me back from the door, said very low, You'll be on duty at the Black Eagle building for a few days more. Try and get Troop again and ask him what time Miss Whitehall left that night. Don't say a word of what he tells you to anyone, but as soon as you get it, let me know. End of chapter 7